Okay, so I'm sure you guys have seen this list. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. This is the concept of a whole food plant-based diet. Less is more with the oils, your foundation, your basis. This is also similar to the Mediterranean diet concept. The basis for the Mediterranean diet is about seven to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables, which is why I think it also makes a big difference in terms of lowering cardiovascular risk. Um, grains, remember grains are not the enemy. People are having aversion and a fear for grains because of weight, but it's the processing and it's the, it's the lack of nutrients and, um, the lack of fiber that's in the grains that is the problem. So please, you know, try to, um, kind of go after some of those grains because they're really important for, uh, the carbohydrates, the, the glucose, the, the, our body needs grains and they're loaded with lots of nutrients, legumes, beans, Leafy greens are on their own category just because they're so valuable that along with the basis of fruits and vegetables, you want to add leafy greens every day if you can, just so that you can get that serving. Um, nitric oxide is a really big one in the leafy greens that is just it really important for blood pressure management and endothelial health. So chewing kale, for example, um, one of the favorite things that Dr. Esselstein talks about Um which I learned from him that, you know, kale in a smoothie is not as high in nitric oxide as opposed to us chewing kale, which is really important. Um, fats and oils, like I said, nuts and seeds, really good for us, but maybe nuts and seeds, I mean, are really good for us, but we don't want to eat as uh, based on our cardiovascular risk. We have to kind of control them sometimes uh, in moderation. Okay. So diversity of the foods are really important. Eat the rainbow. Remember, 30 different might be the goal. Um, try to get yourself uh, to become resilient in the gut microbiome. So the more we eat, the, the the more variety we eat. It's really easy in the spring and summer to get it. There's parts of the country I know that have a real struggle for getting good quality produce. Um, but in general, you can do teas. Remember, teas and beverages and herbs can also be uh, part of your plant base for 30. You can add mint to your tea. You can add cinnamon to your coffee. You can add um, lots of different things to your beverages as well. So like herbs and um, some spices. So, you know, you can use those as well to diversify. And one other plug for plant-based is that it alkalinizes us so that an alkaline environment is actually very beneficial to the health of our cells. Acidic environments, which are more plant-based with dairy, um, tend to be more along the lines of creating an unhealthy environment and cancer cells sometimes grow easier in an acidic environment. So alkalinization is also another plug for a plant-based. I also want to just mention how you eat is also important. So eating your beautiful salad, but um, in being stressed out because your boss is yelling at you or you're eating in your car. I don't know how you eat a salad in the car when you're driving, but the thought is that when you eat, please eat, please eat mindfully. Because remember that parasympathetic sympathetic is that it's saying, I'm running from a tiger. Even if you're eating really good quality foods, but you're rushing and you're mad or you're upset, you're telling your body you're running from a tiger. So when you eat, eat calmly, support that vagal tone. Your vagus nerve is there to help you digest. But if it's, it can't be on if, you're, if your body's on sympathetic drive while you're eating. And add back spices. I, I can do entire talks on this. Spices are amazing. They're um, loaded in antioxidants. They're packed in nutrients. They just need a little pinch of it. And it adds to your diversity of your gut microbiome. It adds to that diversity of 30 per, per, day per week. Um, and there's so many things to experiment with. Turmeric, ginger, garlic, rosemary, basil, cinnamon. These are my top ones. That, you know, any spices is, is good. So please add spices into your diet. A um, couple of the other um, wor things worth mentioning in the epigenetic world is that uh, calorie restriction we've known for a very long time that calorie restriction promotes longevity um, and the overall lifespan of, 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 of mainly in rats, the studies were done, but 30% reduction in calories expand the expand quality of life and lifespan. So not just living to hundred, but you're living well to hundred, you know, you're living in a better quality of life. So there were different diets that they looked at in the paper, um, which uh, was listed on the first slide. But the carbohydrate, the protein, and the lipids, there are some that were um, a little bit off, and I kind of have to go through some of the, the data between the lipids part, but um, different types of diets were associated with longevity. And so it's worth kind of looking at that. I think that could be a lecture on its own as well. 
Um, remember, carbs are not bad for us. So when we talk about 50% carbohydrates, where well, you're not talking about simple sugars, we're talking about complex carbohydrates, which are in oats and brown rice and sweet potatoes and multigrain cereals. So this is the bulk of where your calories will usually come from. Um, and uh, really, they support because of their fiber content. Also, they support the growth of the micro uh, the microbiome. Okay, so a carb is valuable for cellular and brain energy. It is more efficient than proteins and fats, and it's present present naturally in foods, dairy, vegetables, grains, nests, uh, nuts, and legumes. It's also in pastries and candies and juices. Remember that, but those are not the same carbs. Those are more simple. Um, those simple carbs turn raise glucose faster and raise insulin faster. So we need insulin. It's not a bad thing. In fact, if we don't have insulin, you know, we'll die because there's no way to get the glucose into the cells without insulin. So when we eat a simple sugar, our sugar usually goes very high. When we eat a complex sugar, our sugar goes a little bit high. So the more fiber that it has, the slower that rise is. So in complex carbs, you're going to have a slow rise. When the insulin, when the sugar goes up really high, really quickly, that insulin surges very quickly. And so what happens is that the insulin can push that glucose into the cell. And all of a sudden you're doing this with your sugar. All of a sudden you're getting, I just ate, I feel hungry. Why am I so irritable? I'm cranky. I'm irritable. Let me grab that. You know, you eat something like a box cereal in the morning, high fiber cereal, your sugar goes up doesn't have a lot of fiber, come back down, you crash, you grab a bar that's like a pre-made loaded with preservatives, your sugar goes up, it goes down, you get hungry, you get cranky. This is going all day. The problem is your insulin is doing that all day. And that leads to higher insulin levels, which deposit more fat, which can lead to more inflammation. The truth is that when your sugar is very high or very low, you're going to deposit fat, which is really a concern. We want to reduce obesity. We want to reduce our insulin resistance. So, you know, it really does matter what kind of carbs you take. And remember that when you take in carbohydrates, if it's excess, if you're not expending that energy, it's going to be stored as fat. Um, and our history with carbs is just a love hate thing because we have all these anti carb, low carb diets. But remember what we want to do at the end of the day is grow a diverse microbiome to help us age better. You're not gonna do that without carbohydrates. Okay, so these are just examples of simple carbohydrates. Um, it's found in dairy and cakes and candies and things like that. It just provides energy, but really lacks any nutrients like the phytonutrients or the vitamins and minerals and fiber that we have with CarbFlex. Um, one thing to mention is that natural versus added sugars on the labels, it's worth looking at if you buy things that are have labels on them. Um, the effect of fruit restriction on glycemic control and the role of berries in, in, in blunting spice. So I, um, I have a lot of my patients using the uh, CGMs, which are chronic glucose um, monitoring, even in the, my non-diabetics, because I want to show them the power of their lifestyle. And when you wear one of these, and you only need to do it for a few weeks, you can see how your choices matter and how some things that you may not have thought about actually make a difference. For example, you know, eating a bowl of, you know, good quality oatmeal by itself may raise your sugar to X. But if you add blueberries, the thought would be, that I'm adding more sugar, so my sugar would go higher. But in fact, it actually blunts it and goes lower because you're adding more fiber, you're adding more phytonutrients, you're adding those beautiful colors that the berries have, and it blunts that insulin spike. So really, um, when you do natural sugars, it's not the same as added sugars. It is case by case dependent. The amount of sugar fruits you can have is really dependent on your own body, which is why I love these CGMs that you can wear and you can kind of see you only need to use it for a few weeks to understand what your lifestyle choices will do. And in some cases, it causes um, the insulin to spike. So bottom line, fruit does not adversely affect blood sugar the way that industrial sugar does. So we do eat way too much sugar. Um, you know, there is a six teaspoons a day is the added sugar limit and nine teaspoons for men. I think even this is way too much. This is based on the American Heart Association. We want to move towards less simple sugar this slide shows more about how much sugar is in our beverages, which is shocking. And so a lot of people, they forget to mention how much they're eat, drinking, you know, as a beverage. And so this is one reason why we want to start looking at, you know, moving towards water. Also very, very important. Um, also what you're doing with your coffee, if you're adding tons of sugar in your coffee, 
you're making vegetable juice, but you're throwing in, um, you know, some sort of like a sugar concept to it is also unhealthy, but plain things that are, um, you know, soy milk and vegetable juice, you know, and water, of course, are very, very healthy beverages for us. And we do need to drink. So please choose your beverages well. So it's not just what you eat, it's when you eat matters. So shoot for 12 hours of restriction if you can for um, food, periodic fasting, fasting mimicking diets. We did spend a little time talking about fasting yesterday in our in our um, discussion and the panel discussion. So it's very individualized. Take home messages is at least start with 12 hours of time restricted feeding. It does make a difference. Calorie restriction, you wind up eating not necessarily less, but if your window is smaller that you're eating, you're, you tend to spike your insulin um, less often and less high when you're eating versus eating in a larger, larger window. Mm -hmm.